Hello, my name is Liam Milton McGurk. I'm a PhD student at the University of Sydney, and I'm going to be talking about negatively buoyant jets and fountains. Now, a negatively buoyant jet is a jet like flow, but one that has a buoyancy that opposes its momentum. Eventually, this develops into a fountain. Now, there are two stages of this flow the initial negatively buoyant jet stage which occurs during the initial rise as the jet is getting constantly decelerated by its opposing buoyancy. At some point, this is going to reverse direction after reaching some maximum height and collapse down onto itself. Now, the initial height that it reaches, we're denoting as ZI, the maximum rise height. Once it's collapsed back into itself, it forms an inner flow, out of flow structure, um, like shown and it oscillates around some other height called the steady state height. Now the initial rise, we're gonna call the negatively buoyant jet stage. This has a velocity profile, something like this, uh, where it's all, everything is positive, while the fully developed case has a sort of positive inner core and negative velocities on the outside. Now, because negatively buoyant jets don't have a return flow, we can use some of the same tools that we commonly apply to plumes or buoyant jets. That is, we can define velocity, length, and buoyancy scales based on integral quantities of the flow, such as the local volume, momentum, and integral buoyancy, which are obtained by integrating the mean profiles from zero to infinity. Now, using those scales, we can define a local Froude number, which is defined here. And this is essentially a ratio between the momentum and the buoyancy. A high Froude number corresponds to a momentum-driven flow. Uh, a neutral jet, for example, that has no buoyancy would have an infinite Froude number. Now in this plot, I'm showing a Froud, source Froud number of 30 negatively buoyant jet that starts from that 30 and it will continually decelerate, that is Froud number reducing until it hits zero at its maximum height. This is where the velocity goes to zero. And this maximum height is governed by that source Froud number. A constant multiplied by that source Froud number will tell you what the initial height is. Now the inner flow of a fountain um, you can do a similar thing. So instead of defining some integral quantities from zero to infinity, we can define it to the boundary that separates the inner flow and the outer flow. That is the point where the velocity first equals zero. So if you do this, you can generate your new velocity length and buoyancy scales, but that correspond to the inner flow only. Again, you get a Froude number out of this. Um, and I plotted that over here for a Froude number 15 and Froude number 30. Um, Again, it starts off at whatever source Froude number has. And as the flow rises, it reaches um, its steady state height where the Froude number goes to zero. Again, this is a function of the source Froude number where say for a Froude number of 30, the steady state height is gonna be twice that of a Froude number 15. We are taking an experimental approach to gather data on this flow. We're using two dimensional particle image photosymmetry and laser-induced fluorescence. This will give us velocity and scalar measurements. Uh, this is a schematic of our experimental setup. We have um, a few cameras over here. We have a calibration box that lets us correct for variations in laser power and a large 1000 liter tank here where we inject fluid above into the main tank. So here's another schematic of the experiment. So during the initial stage where we were injecting light fluid down into heavier water, where the source water is a mixture of fresh water, ethanol and rhodamine dye, um, and the ambient is salt water, this will descend into the tank and then return up, collapsing back onto itself, forming that fully developed fountain stage. Um, here are some typical experimental parameters. Um, Reynolds number of 5,800, Froude numbers of 15 and 30. And we optimize our experiments for either the negatively buoyant jet stage or the final fully developed fountain stage. This allows us to get sort of a sufficient number of images for each experiment. So here's um, some statistics. So these are mean velocity profiles for both the negatively buoyant jet and fully developed fountain stage, normalized here by the centerline velocity and by the local half width. We see for the negatively buoyant jet, they're very much Gaussian shapes at a wide range of local Froude numbers, even near the top. Um, and it's when normalized in this way, it looks exactly uh, very similar to a neutral jet, where she's also shown as a reference. 
The fountain case, however, although there is a degree of similarity in the inner flow, uh, certainly not in the outer flow, and the shape is changing quite significantly with axial distance. Here are the scalar profiles or buoyancy profiles. And similarly to the last slide, we have in the case of a negatively buoyant jet, um, we have Gaussian profiles over the full range investigated and uh, very similar to a neutral jet. Whilst for the fountain, it's certainly not Gaussian. Um, again, a degree of similarity in the inner flow, but very much different shapes um, in the outer region. The Reynolds stress, however, um, we see something a little bit more interesting, where in both cases for the fountain and negatively buoyant jet, we see there is a systematic increase in this profile um, with axial distance. So that is the Reynolds stress normalized by the centerline velocity squared is increasing up the jet or up the fountain. Now this is not a result of the actual turbulence production increasing, rather it's because the mean flow is decreasing and so this quantity increases. So another way to think about that is that the turbulence is not decreasing at the same rate as the mean flow. Um, this makes sense if you just think about the top of a fountain where the velocity goes to zero, but there is still non-zero turbulence. Now, when it comes to modeling the negatively buoyant jet stage, we can attempt to use some of the same approaches that are commonly applied to neutral and buoyant jets since there's no return flow. That is, we integrate the conservation equations from r equals zero to infinity, it's radially, to derive this set of ODEs, that is the conservation of volume, momentum, and buoyancy flux. Now I'd like to draw your attention to alpha, this term here, which is called the entrainment coefficient. Now this is the ratio between the velocity entrained into the jet to some axial characteristic velocity at that height. Now, by combining these three equations with a fourth for mean axial kinetic energy, we can drive an expression for this entrainment coefficient. Now, these terms are defined in this corner, but in summary, the first term of the expression reflects the ratio of turbulence production to mean kinetic energy. That is the effect that turbulence has on entrainment. The second term um, reflects the effect of buoyancy on entrainment through the local Richardson number. The local Richardson number is the inverse square of the Froude number, that is the ratio of buoyancy to momentum. So this is a negative number in negatively buoyant jets and approaches negative infinity at the top as the velocity goes to zero. The third term reflects the shape of the profiles and how they change with axial distance. And as we saw in the mean velocity plot on the previous slide, the velocity profiles were Gaussian over a wide range of locations, and so this term goes to approximately zero. We then proceed to calculate entrainment for these non-zero terms in a negatively buoyant jet with a source Froude number of 30. Now, the first term is shown by the dark blue markers up here, which is shown to increase with negative Richardson number. Now, this is related to the increasing normalized Reynolds stresses that we saw on a previous slide. Uh, the red markers reflect the second term and is almost linear. And this is because the terms in the bracket are almost constant compared to the changing Richardson number. So the result is an approximately linear line. So then by summing these two together, we get the black markers over here, which reflect the overall entrainment coefficient in a negatively buoyant jet. Now we see that it starts positive and then decreases with increasing Richardson number, eventually becoming negative uh, at around Richardson number is minus 0.2. Now this reflects a net radial outflow from the negatively buoyant jet to the environment. Um, I've also shown in these light blue stars here, the entrainment coefficient for a Froude number 10 negatively buoyant jet. And we can see it's pretty similar to the Froude number 30 case. And this contrasts to neutral jets, which have a Richardson number of zero and a constant entrainment coefficient. And I've shown this here as this horizontal black line at around 0 0.07, which was calculated using the same experimental setup. And we see that the if you took a linear fit of the entrainment coefficient for a negatively buoyant jet, the y-intercept is very close to the neutral jet value. And this makes sense because as the, the Richardson number approaches zero, the flow becomes more and more momentum dominated, and you should expect it to be similar to a neutral jet. Now we can apply a similar analysis to the fully developed fountain. 
except we instead integrate the conservation equations from zero to the inner flow outer flow boundary, which is the point where the velocity profile goes to zero. This results in an almost identical set of equations, except in the entrainment expression, we now have this extra term here. Now, this is a boundary condition between the inner flow and the outer flow, reflecting the fact that the shear stress does not go to zero at this point. But we can measure it with the experimental data. So we've done so here, where this plot shows entrainment for a frat number 15 and 30 fountains, shown in the red and blue crosses, respectively. We see that the alpha is negative for the majority of the height, except for a small region at the near the source. That is that for the vast majority of the height, the radial flow at this boundary is from the inner flow to the outer flow, whereas near the source in the alpha positive region, we see from the outer flow to the inner flow. Another key observation here is that entrainment is consistently lower, alpha is consistently lower in the frat number 15 fountain than the frat number 30. This is quite different to the negatively buoyant jet case where we saw that the frat number of 10 and 30 had quite similar entrainment coefficients. Now, this can be attributed to the outer flow because if you recall, the Richardson number was defined just on inner flow quantities. So at a particular Richardson number, the outer flow in both of those fountains may be different. You can also think of this at the origin or at the source where the Richardson number is zero in both cases, but the outer flow may be different um, for both that frat number 30 and frat number 15 fountains. So in summary, we've done an experimental study into negatively buoyant jets and fountains, both the initial and steady stages of the flow. For negatively buoyant jets, the velocity and buoyancy profiles are Gaussian at a wide range of locations, similar to a neutral jet. Um, the entrainment coefficient is approximately linear with Richardson number decreasing and eventually becoming negative. In fountains, the mean profiles are not Gaussian and they're not self-similar, except there is a degree of similarity in the inner flow. The entrainment coefficient describing flow between the inner flow and the outer flow regions is negative for the majority of the height, indicating fluid is being expelled from the inner flow into the outer flow. Now the presence of an outer flow creates an apparent source for our number dependence on this entrainment coefficient. This is because at a given location, the outer flow in two different fountains may be different. In the future, it may be useful to try to define uh, the entrainment coefficient in such a way to include the downflow or the outer flow, potentially seeking a universal description of entrainment for arbitrary fraud numbers. Other ongoing research is to look at previous fountain models, which decompose entrainment into inflow and outflow components like shown in this schematic here. These models typically assume constant entrainment coefficients to describe these radial components, but using the present experimental data, we can investigate this formulation without assuming constant entrainment. And with that, I will leave it there. And uh, thank you for listening to my talk.